Yo, what's good, E7 fam? Pat here, back to talk about the 2022 year in review for Epic 7. This has been a really good year for this game. So just like with last year, I kind of wanted to go over all of the great things and some of the not so great things that happened this year with our fantastic game. I'll be talking about things like quality of life changes, the new heroes and artifacts that came out this year, new PvE content, all of the different changes to PvP, and some not so happy stories that also happened this year as well. So sit down, buckle up, and I hope you do enjoy this year in review. I had an absolute blast making it. Let's kick this video off by talking about the huge list of quality of life changes. This is gonna be by far the longest section in this video. Epic Seven has been receiving weekly or bi-weekly updates pretty much all year, and almost all of them contain some kind of improvement to the overall game experience. There have been a staggering amount of changes to the game this year, at least over 40 or more by my accounts. I'll try my best to quickly cover the most important changes in each month that we've had this year. This year started off with a bang thanks to the introduction of the High Media Pack, allowing players to view their favorite skills in stunning detail. This month also marked the release of the new Guardian, Kazaran, who for the most part fell flat. Perhaps the biggest standout of the month of January, however, was the addition of the open recruitment function for Expeditions. This allowed players to get help if they were struggling to clear the rewards ladder or blaze through it faster than they ever thought possible. February only really had one major change in the Mystic Summon revamp system. This would allow players to finally have the ability to pity new Moonlight 4-star heroes that were released alongside other Moonlight 5-star heroes in the Mystic banners. March was a bit of a more interesting month if you were somebody who was serious about PvP. This was the month that we finally got the introduction of the new Battle Frenzy effects to help balance out World Arena. There were changes made to red, green, and blue units to help further balance them out, but I think the real kicker was the additional speed given to certain classes. Initially, they gave 20 extra speed to Soul Weavers in the preliminary testing phases. To the surprise of literally no one, this would later be walked back to 15 speed. Leading into the World Championship season later on in the year, it then was further walked back yet again to just 7 speed. Needless to say, for most of this year, DN and her friends were living large thanks to these changes. The month of April would give us the largest set of quality of life changes all year with Epic 7's much anticipated Awaken update. All players would receive a free copy of the heroes Sermia, Vivian, and Segret. These lovely ladies would really allow you to jumpstart a new account in terms of progression, or if you were a veteran, obviously they were pretty sweet imprints and upgrades. Custom Group and Custom Mystic Summons also made their debut in this patch and made it significantly easier for players to get their hands on the specific characters that they wanted to play. I personally feel that this is a huge step in the right direction for the game as one of the biggest barriers to entry in World Arena is the feeling of not having access to a full roster. For a game like Epic 7 with eSports aspirations, I feel it is imperative that the player base feels invested and feels like they can actually compete at a higher level. Otherwise, a lot of the excitement around the game will just end up falling flat. The other biggest hurdle for most players in this game is the ability for them to gear their heroes. Thankfully, the Awaken update Address this by giving us access to features such as crafting mileage, as well as the recommended equipment settings to help smooth things over for those players. Moving into June, the Injury Set and Destruction Set both received a round of buffs. With the changes, Injury Set became a much better option for single target heroes like Alencia, which would help cement her as one of the best save picks all year in World Arena. The changes to Destruction made it mathematically the set that gave the most amount of free stats, which was used to then bolster powerful meta picks such as Apocalypse Robbie and Spectre Tenebria. While June was more about helping out the balances for PvP, August added something that was much more fun to the game with the addition of the Jukebox feature. This allows everyone to change the game's lobby music to any track from the game's discography if they so fancy. My personal favorite song will always be Promise because that song really slaps, but I also really do like the song Blood and Dagger as well. Moving right along to the month of September, we had the long-awaited Grace of Growth system. This would allow players to try out characters at max level with upgraded skills before deciding if they wanted to invest Malagora into them. 
While the system is mostly great, it is not without its flaws since the basic skill is oftentimes not max level. This is pretty rough for certain heroes such as Roy Mustang, who has a lot of value tied up in his S1. This month, though, also introduced the unit favoring system, which would allow you to select and sort characters much faster in specific game modes such as World Arena. Perhaps the best quality of life, though, feature that we got all year came at the tail end of October with the introduction of background battling. This feature was a godsend as it allowed players to multitask and run game modes such as Hunt in the background while playing things such as Side Story or even while duking it out in World Arena. The feature isn't without its flaws though, however. Namely, you can't background battle in Side Stories or Adventures. And it also doesn't really work when the app is closed like some of its other gotcha game competitors. Still though, this is a huge step in the right direction and it really helps alleviate some of the grind for a lot of players. The other big change in October was something most players wouldn't really be able to take full advantage of until November and that was the Labyrinth System Overhaul. The first change was the addition of the Nightmare difficulty to the Azimacalus of Cycle Raid. The other major changes were improved rewards, such as an influx of epic artifact charms, powerful I level 88 equipment, and even a free 5 star artifact tied to Nixseed Sanctum. The last two quality of life changes for the year are actually incredibly fun to talk about. In late November, we got custom lobbies, which allowed players to have a bit of expression and swap out the tavern for some of the game's awesome live 2D art of their favorite husband or waifu. If that's really not your jam, you can always use one of the game's fantastic pieces of in-game art as a background as well. The last feature is only about a week or so old though in terms of release, but it is pretty awesome. In late December, we finally got a replay feature for PvP. And I gotta be honest with you guys, I didn't really expect this thing to actually be as good as it is, but it's pretty sweet. You can share some of your best moments with your friends or guildmates inside the game, complete with things like captions and a full-fledged video player. With the mountain of quality of life changes behind us, let's talk about PvE content for a minute. While Epic 7 feels incredibly high quality from a production standpoint, I still think that PvE is definitely an area where this game is lacking compared to many of its peers. The most obvious part of this is going to be the game's adventure mode. Episode 4 wrapped up this year, and it feels like such a massive step backwards compared to Episode 3. So much of the oxygen in this game mode is tied up by Aiden that by the end of the adventure, I personally started to despise this character. Many of the earlier Aiden quests were incredibly time as well as stamina consuming compared to other similar quests inside of the game. I'm specifically looking at you, Boot Quest. Narratively, this thing is also a complete mess. The driving force for most of this story is asking your audience to accept the fact that characters like Zahak and Arya make totally irrational decisions, and being okay with that. Many characters have tons of wasted potential, like Apocalypse Ravi or Harado as well. Teyu and Aiden honestly feel like afterthoughts, and they're supposed to be the main characters of this episode. Then there's also the problem of your new characters just being obvious rehashes of existing characters and stories that we've already had. Take a look at Arunka and Pera. Their entire story can be summarized as cat girl Cecilia tries to save wolf girl Luna at the end of the day. The antagonist also feels fairly half-baked compared to what we had in episode 2 and episode 3. As I said in my 2021 year review, Fate Grand Order still feels like the king in this category. Even the Christmas side story in Nat Geo this year felt like it was leagues better in terms of writing quality than almost anything Epic 7 offered up this year in its main scenario. If there was anything to praise this year though in terms of writing for E7, it was Game of Princes as well as Moonlight Theater. We're going into the fifth year of Epic 7's life at this point, so I think it's about time our main scenario starts having the caliber of writing found in Moonlight Theater at the bare minimum. Moving off of PvE story and onto PvE game features, the only new game mode this year was Ancient Inheritance, which was another topic I touched on in my 2021 review. While Ancient Inheritance didn't disappoint, I wouldn't exactly call it a smashing success either. The concept of a co-op dungeon with your guild in order to get some amazing loot is a fantastic idea. 
I think the execution though isn't quite where it needs to be as class balance feels incredibly skewed towards warriors and subsequent runs don't feel nearly as exciting or meaningfully different than your first few playthroughs. Still, this game mode is a lot better than many other PvE pieces of content that I played this year from other gacha games. The other PvE pieces of content this year included another level of Advent, which is Nature's Decline and Decay, as well as a fifth difficulty level for the Automaton Tower. There was also a new Hall of Trials boss in Faustus, as well as the new Abyss Challenge mode and the aforementioned Nightmare difficulty for the Azimacallus of Cycle Raid. Most of these feel like a new coat of paint over something we've been doing for a while now, and as a result, they kind of feel pretty tedious after your first playthrough. If there was one standout amongst the new versions of old content that we've gotten this year, it is going to be Abyss Challenge mode for me. This thing has been a surprisingly fun change of pace. Instead of Abyss Challenge mode being another frustrating round of random bullshit like the original Abyss, this one takes a very different approach in that it requires you to come up with teams that meet a certain set of criteria. Fights feel like you're rewarded for having a solid strategy and using a diverse set of units. This is in stark contrast to the Abyss of Old, where you just keep trying to get lucky using some random dual attack strategy that you found on YouTube. I really do hope that this is the style of challenging content that Epic 7 tosses our way in the future. Making guides for this new mode on my channel here has been the highlight for me as a content creator this year. I really, really enjoyed it. If you watch my 2021 review guide, you know that we were going to talk about collabs for sure in this 2022 video. Epic 7 had four collabs this year, two of which were reruns and two were all new. Our first pseudo rerun collab came back in March for a game that I personally love, which was Guilty Gear Strive. Jacko Valentine joined the game as a limited five-star fire warrior, but ultimately failed to make a huge impact on the game's PvP meta. At least this collab allowed players to hoard more copies of the artifact portrait of the saviors while listening to the fantastic Strive OST. One of my personal favorite tracks, by the way, is Mirror of the World, and it actually ended up making it into Epic 7. The other rerun that we had this year was for ReZero back in May, with surprisingly no changes at all. How do you rerun a collab and have no new characters, especially when Echidna was one of the most popular anime characters of 2021? Still don't know whose decision it was to leave her out of this rerun. Our first new collab of 2022 would come in late August with the Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood collab. I, as well as many other of you out there, were probably pretty stoked when this was first announced. Me personally, I feel like Brotherhood is one of the greatest, if not the greatest anime of all time. It is pretty much timeless, a perfect story from start to finish. Having Edward Elric and his friends Roy Mustang and Riza Hawkeye come to Orbis honestly felt like a dream come true. The side story was also surprisingly fun, tying into the mysterious arena narrative that's been going on since the game's launch. Edward Elric and Roy Mustang, despite some initial reservations, as well as a buff to help out our boy Full Metal, did end up sticking the landing. Both of these characters are powerhouse units that are used heavily even now as of the recording of this video. The final collab of 2022 would be one that I think none of us really saw coming. That of course being K-pop group sensation Espa. What the heck was a K-pop group doing in our anime-based gacha game anyways? Despite those reservations and hangups, I think though I can say with confidence that the Espa Club might be the best one we've ever had in Epic 7. I Karina, I Winter, I Giselle, and I Ningning Ning are all fairly fun and powerful units that don't break the game in the same way that many other collab heroes have done in the past. The soundtrack is also a lot catchier than I thought it would be, and the collab story about reviving Bellion was much more interesting than anything served up by the game's main narrative this year. By the end of this whole thing, I found myself humming Black Mamba and hoping that one day we would eventually get that really sick belly in skin. Smilegate, if you're watching this, please release that as a skin. When it comes to PvP, there is little doubt that 2022 will be remembered as the year of Japan for Epic 7. World Arena originally released in the last week of 2019, but not all servers were able to access this feature. The Japanese server of Epic 7 released a whole year after the global server, playing on a different version of the game almost the entire time. Over the years, they've steadily moved at a brisk pace in order to catch up to every other version of the game. And finally, this year, at the beginning of spring, Japan had finally caught up. 
they could finally enter the World Arena matchmaking pool. We wouldn't really get to see what they could do though until June with the release of the Epic 7 World Championship preliminaries. Unlike in 2021 where World Championship participants were chosen like candidates from a pool of submitted resumes, 2022 had players actually battle it out to climb a ladder in a new best of three PvP game mode. Honestly, this was a fantastic addition as it gave players a taste of what competing in the World Championship would actually feel like and the spots also felt more earned or deserved than the year prior. I personally fell in love with this game mode as the best of three nature made me feel right at home, feeling very akin to the counterpick nature of sideboarding in competitive card games. I do wish that this game mode was the actual standard RTA ladder, but I recognize that perhaps matches might be taking a bit too long for something like a mobile game. Talking about the actual 2022 Epic 7 World Championship though, this was a home run in my book. Smilegate invested heavily into getting an actual esports production team complete with analysts and professional commentators, and it paid off huge. While nowhere near as grandiose as something like the League of Legends World Championship, this was still a massive step in the right direction for the game. The presentation was clean, and all of the relevant cooldowns and statistics were readily available, which made watching matches exciting and, and more importantly, engaging. My dearest hope is that Smilegate and Super Creative will release a tournament hosting mode so that content creators can commentate matches with this same level of information at their disposal that we found here. As for the actual tournament itself, many participated, including crowd favorites such as Elvmage from the Asia server and Jintae from the global server. But it was at the end of the day, Japan who would take home the trophy. Congratulations to our newest world champion, Phantom, for his hard-earned victory, and congratulations to his adorable cat, Nan Nan, for being immortalized in this awesome shoe skin. Speaking of immortalized, I think I'd be incredibly remiss to not talk about one of the sadder stories of the year involving a specific person from our game. I'm of course speaking of the passing of the late and great Billy Kometz. For those of you who do not know, Billy was the English voice actor responsible for one of this year's most played heroes in Ran. He lent his incredible talents to many beloved and popular characters such as Josuke Higashikata from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure and Naofumi from The Rising of the Shield Hero. On June 17th, the Epic 7 team issued a statement acknowledging Billy's works on the game, saying, quote, We will always remember him in our hearts. Rest in peace, Billy. You will be sorely missed. The other major news story for E7 this year also came in June, in which the Korean GRAC, as well as tech company Apple, issued an age change rating for Epic 7. This, of course, was courtesy of our massively endowed hero, Arya, who was released earlier this year, back in April. The character would need to be heavily censored, or Smilegate and Super Creative would have to accept the proposed 18 plus age rating change. For those that don't know, Epic 7 is listed as a game for players over the age of 15 in most app stores around the world, but only listed as 12 plus on the Apple App Store. The reason for this is because Apple only offers the option to be listed as a 12 plus or 18 plus game with no in between. Epic 7 at its inception was originally designed to be an 18 plus game. You need only look at character designs for characters like Robbie or Rowana who have been around since before the game's launch, or look at the alpha footage of Mercedes in a thong to realize this. So why the change? Well, to be blunt, it's money. Applications with an 18 plus rating don't get promoted the same way as other games, which results in less visibility and potentially less money. This means that you need to either tone down your game or risk a potentially huge loss of revenue. This whole incident sparked an outrage amongst a portion of the community. Many fans felt that potential censorship of Arya and the upcoming proposed changes to Sylvan Sage Vivian meant that waifus of a certain variety and <clears throat> size were no longer welcome in this game. In the end, Epic 7 ended up brokering some kind of deal to allow Arya to remain uncensored, but we don't really know the full details of that. The fallout of this decision ranges from mild to catastrophic, depending on who you ask. Sylvan Sage Vivian was released in a censored state. But more importantly than that is that this decision led to one of the game's lead character designers, Saren199, to depart from the Epic 7 team as well as Smilegate altogether. Saren, if you don't know, has been responsible for many of the game's most beloved and popular heroes. He has been responsible for all versions of the characters that have been appearing across your screen during this entire segment. 
odds are one of your favorite characters was designed by him too. I know my personal favorites like Sermia, Corinne, and Luna most certainly were. It's sad to see such an influential artist leave, and it really does make you wonder what other character designs we will or won't be getting in the future. Now we get to take a look at one of the features that I'm sure many of you are all here to see, and that is looking back on all of the heroes that were released this year in 2022. This year, we had 37 new heroes, and I will display all of them on your screen now. This is one more than last year in which we had 36. A couple of notes to take away here from all of this. One, we had less Moonlight 5-star heroes here this year than previous years. This is due to the gap in time between the release of Pirate Captain Flan and Sylvan Sage Vivian. If you remember, there was a several month period where the developers wanted us to have the ability to summon various different banners in order for us to quote unquote catch up. We also had much more specialty changes this year than last year, although that was largely due to Aiden and her four different specialty changes. We also had a fair amount more limited characters this year as well, but that is mostly due to the Espa collab. Now, let's take a look at some of the best RGBs from this year, as well as Moonlight 5 Star Heroes. I think my honorable mention for the best RGB, Red, Green, Blue Hero of this year, will go to Edward Elric. This character was originally released in a seemingly underpowered state. However, after his hotfix, he has been an absolute all-star. Equivalent Exchange is a powerful passive, and its follow-up attack, Rise, can be devastating for his opponents. Edward has carved a path out for himself, being excellent in nearly all forms of content, whether that is Nightmare Raid, Guild War Offense, or even World Arena. The Full Metal Alchemist definitely delivered on his name this year. He might actually be the best overall unit in the game right now as of the recording of this video. He's just very versatile and useful in a huge number of scenarios. That said, I don't think he is my RGB character of the year. That title can really only go to one character. In my opinion, the best RGB 5-star that was released this year is no doubt Hua Yang. No unit has had more of an impact on Epic 7 this year than Hua Yang. She was inescapable for nearly the entire year thanks to the raw power of her skill 3, Monarch's Flaming Strike. She defined Guild Wars as a game mode and completely shifted the entire way the player base operated in World Arena. Nearly permanently pre-manned all the time, even that fact forced players to re-gear characters with much higher health than they had previously and equipped them with artifacts like Proof of Valor in the off chance that she snuck through the drafting phase. The unprecedented decision to nerf Hua Young and overturn years of a no-nerf policy by the developers was the final nail in the coffin for this decision. Honestly, who else could have been the most impactful character this year other than Hua Young? Taking a look at the Moonlight 5 stars, it is a bit easier to see which one is the best one of the year. Several of the characters are niche, and there's not a huge list to actually pick from. If I had to pick a runner-up for this year, I would have chosen Zeo. Zeo is an incredibly powerful hero thanks to his passive Supreme Authority. Speed has been the most dominant stat in Epic 7 for the game's entire lifespan, so by releasing a hero that can counter that stat, it has been something of a blessing. The only real reason that I didn't choose Zeo as the Moonlight 5 star of the year is because of the same reason that I didn't choose Conqueror Lilius last year. The character is simply too new, and I don't think we can fully grasp the character's impact until several formats have actually passed. If I had to choose the best Moonlight 5 star hero, at least in my opinion for this year, it would go to Lionheart Sermian. This is a character that has been around pretty much all year, and as such, we have a pretty good idea of how strong she actually is. Sermia's passive, It's Far From Over, allows her to spam her skill 3, I Am The Victor, when she's battling against enemies that use a lot of extra attacks, dual attacks, or counter attacks. And surprisingly, those types of enemies come up more often than you think, whether that's in World Arena, Guild Wars, Labyrinth, or even something like Ancient Inheritance. She feels akin to Rowana in a sense that when she's good, she feels damn good, almost oppressively so. One of my biggest regrets of the year, I think, was not rating her higher in my Moonlight Headhunting video. It took until a couple of my guildmates actually acquired her 
and voiced how good the character actually was to me, somebody who plays her on the regular all the time, for that to really sink in. So yeah, those are my picks for the best heroes of the year. Let me know if you guys agree or disagree with my picks down in the comments below. To finish up the video, let's take a quick look at all of the artifacts and exclusive equipments that came out this year. By my accounts, there are 25 new artifacts that came out this year. And if I had to pick a best one, I'm going to take the cop-out answer and choose Prelude to an Era because it's just Portrait of the Saviors with a different name, which is a proven and powerful artifact. Most of the other artifacts that are released this year are very niche or very powerful, but only on a specific subset of characters. Think of things like Indestructible Gators on Inferno Kawazu or Goblet of Oath on Peyra. Looking at the new exclusive equipments, we have 18 new ones this year. The two standouts, at least in my mind, are for Green Sid as well as Zahak. Green Sid obviously gets a massive boost from the change to his S3 hack and made him an absolute terror in World Arena for a better part of this year. Zahak is a more interesting case, and I think if I had to pick one, I think he is definitely the one with the best set of exclusive equipments for this year. The resource reduction on his S3 was super, super invaluable and made him a relevant counter pick to Lionheart Sermia for the first half of the year. After his most recent round of buffs, the attack on his S2 ended up being the better choice for the current usage of Zahak, who is being heavily played right now in all facets of PvP. So yeah, Zahak definitely feels like he had the best glow up for the exclusive equipments this year. And that is going to do it for the 2022 year in review. Hopefully you enjoyed it. As I said before, I had an absolute blast making it. If I made any mistakes or forgot anything, let me know down in the comments below. And also let me know again what your favorite part of 2022 was for Epic 7. Would love to hear from you. Thank you also for all of the kind wishes and get well soon messages that I've received over the past couple of weeks to months. My health has almost made a full recovery at this point. I have about 90% of my hearing back in my left ear. And also, aside from a mild cough, it feels like my health is also back to pretty much 100%. So I do hopefully expect to do a lot more content in the year of 2023. Again, you can expect the Katie's Guide from me very shortly after the new year, as well as the usual how to play things. And again, I do want to take a stab at live streaming over on Twitch. So if you're keen for that, I'll link that down in this video's description. Pretty much that's it for the video. Hopefully you enjoyed it again. Have a happy new year and I'll see you all next year. Bye-bye now.